Revelation chapter 6. Let's pray. Lord, as we open your word and spend some time together there, we, we ask that you would uh, spend some time in our hearts and speak to us and help us focus our attention on what you want to say. And Lord, that you would have the freedom to speak to us. It's easy for us sometimes to shut you out when we don't want to hear what you have to say. And I just ask you to help us to be open with soft hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. As we step into chapter 6, you might remember in chapter 5, there's a scroll and it's got seven seals. And no one, Scripture says, is uh, able to open it. In fact, in chapter 5, verse 3, no one in heaven or in earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to even look at it. But it goes on to say, a lamb, one this lamb, as one as had been slain, took the scroll. So, so that's, the, that's the entryway, really, into chapter 6. There's a lamb who takes this scroll, only one worthy. No one in heaven, under heaven. In other words, no one's able to do it. All heaven, it says, begins, begins to weep. And then this lamb that, that appears as if it's been slain uh, takes the scroll and they begin to sing a new song in verse 9, it says in chapter 5. You, you are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals. Now this is a, a all of heaven is, is singing this song. This is pretty phenomenal. And you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. And out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you've made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. I mean, this is a, an amazing song. As Jesus, the Lamb, comes and takes this scroll and is about to open these seals. And so you have the Lamb of God. He has the scroll. He's about to open the seals. And please listen, pay attention. These seals are being opened after, as we saw in chapter 4, verse 1, that the church has been called up to heaven. The rapture has occurred. And, and so we begin this, this, this time with the seven seals. It says in verse 1, chapter 6, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals... And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. Now I saw. In many translations it says, and I saw. And I saw. In fact, the, the actual Greek word is the word and, and it's a word uh, that sounds like this, kai, K-A-I. K -A -I. And it's, and it's repeated in 16 verses over and over again. And I saw, and I saw. It's kind of like a, uh, uh, if, if you will, it's like a meter in a song or, a, or a, 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 a pace that increases. Every time a seal is open, and I saw, and I saw, and I saw. It's like this building tempo, if you will. And the Lamb, or Jesus, the Lord of the future, if you will, begins to open these seals as he stands in the throne room of heaven after this thunderous song. It's a, it's a powerful image. And he begins to open the seals and set in motion the events and the mysteries that are contained there that no one else could open. He, he's breaking open these unleashing judgment, really, to come upon the earth and to bring an end, if you will, the end of all human rule and all human government. 
In chapter 11, verse 15, uh, it says, then the seventh angel sounded, there were loud voices in heaven. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, forever and ever, forever and ever. That's a long time, <laughs> forever and ever. And chapter 6 is a lot like when, when Jesus describes in, in Matthew, and I'll read it for you. It's very similar as you read through chapter 6, that, that final discourse that Jesus talks about the end times. And in chapter 24 of Matthew, he, he says this, he says, And you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. And it says, you know, all these are the beginning of sorrows. And that's, that verse, all, the beginning of sorrows is the same phrase as birth pangs. All these are the beginning of birth pangs. And they'll deliver you up to tribulation, kill you. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. He talks about wars. He talks about famine. He talks about death. And he talks about martyrdom. And it's the same thing that the same kind of process and same kind of schedule, if you will, that's talked about here in Revelation chapter 6. Wars, famines, death, martyrdom. All kinds of conflict, destruction, and deception is what chapter 6 is full of. Aren't you glad you're here today? It's crazy stuff. Some, some, someone would say, well, well, is this divine? Is God in control? Yeah. As we would say in the 60s, it's cosmic, man. It's cosmic. <laughs> is it satanic? This, 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 this thing to destroy mankind, yeah, it is satanic. Satan's involved in a heavy way. Is it angelic? Oh, yeah. The angels are proclaiming. They're announcing. Are, 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 there, are there human powers involved? Yeah, wars and rumors of wars and, and humans are fighting one another. Is it geological? Yeah, the planet begins to shake. It's all those things. And there in chapter 6, I, I saw when the Lamb, verse 1, opened the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. And one writer I read had an analogy can be made like this. In first century, first century times, in an, in an amphitheater or a circus, with various chariots and riders, uh, there would be a shout uh, uh, from someone on the center of the arena that would say, come or come forth. And all of a sudden, out of the shadows, chariots would thunder forth. So, so this is kind of the imagery that they're, they're hearing and thinking of. These chariots are about to, to come. So here they come. The first four seals involve four riders and four horses thundering across the earth. In chapter 6, verse 2, and, and I looked, and behold, a white horse who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he, he went out conquering and to conquer. And when he opened the second seal, I heard a second living creature saying, come and see. The first is a white horse. The rider carries a bow. He carries a weapon, and he's given a crown Many people have mistaken because of Revelation 19 where Jesus is on a white horse that, that this is Jesus. But there's no similarity between Jesus and this person riding a white horse except that he's an imposter, he's a deceiver. David Jeremiah, that, that famous pastor says, or calls him the dark prince on a white horse. This is the Antichrist. Or to put it in a different language, it means against Christ. Or you could look at it this way, instead of Christ. He's got many names in Scripture. There's over a hundred 
passages that deal with the Antichrist. He's been called the man of sin. He's been called the son of perdition. He's been called the wicked one. He's been called the prince to come. He's been called, been called the one who makes desolate. He's been called the beast. He's been called Hillary Clinton. No, that's a joke. That, that. <laughs> We're, that's just a joke, right? <laughs> we're, we're just lightening things up a little bit. <laughs> Scripture says he'll rise to power as a world leader at, at a time of great worldwide need economically. He'll bring economic stability, worldwide peace. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, let no one deceive you by any means for the day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin, that's, that's our guy, is revealed. The son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And he'll seek to establish a one world faith or a one world religion. And I believe it'll, it'll be uh, a combination of, of all religions and all faiths kind of mixed together. A little bit of Muslim, a little bit of Hindu, a little bit of Buddhist, a little bit of Christianity, a little bit of occult, a little bit of New Age. It's kind of that mantra or that bumper sticker that you've seen that says, coexist. It's all, you know, sort of meld together. We all pray to the same God. We just, just use a different name. I'm sure you've heard that. But Deuteronomy says, you know, hero Israel, there is only one God. And the Bible teaches over and over again that there's one God who loved us and sent his son to save us. The essence of the one world faith will be a little bit of this, a little bit of that, very tolerant of all practices and religious systems. The only people who will not be tolerated will be people who believe the Bible is the word of God. They're not to be tolerated because they're intolerant of all other faiths. Antichrist will have an ABC religion, anything but Christ. That'll be his deal. Let me just stop here for just a second. I just see Bremer and Haley here who just got married. Their first time back in church. Why don't you guys stand up real quick? <laughs> okay, back to the Antichrist. <laughs> Do you think he's the Antichrist now that you're married to him? No, it's okay. Anything but Christ. How do you... How do you deal with that. In, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 2, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. This is kind of what begins to happen in, in the end times. In 2 Timothy Chapter 4, verse 3, for the time will come will they, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. And this is the, the, the mixing and melding together. Because they have itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teachers. They'll turn their ears away from the truth, and they'll be turned aside to fables. And what's our response to that? Well, 2 Timothy, again, chapter 4, says, preach the word. That's our response to it. Be ready in season, out of season, the, the season when doctrine is being, you know, destroyed, the season when it's solid. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time will come. Here it is again. Well, they'll not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, they have itching ears. They'll heap up for themselves teachers. So this first seal is, 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 is in process, and you've got this, this horseman. It's the Antichrist, and he says he, 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 he has a crown, he ha has a bow. He, he opens now in verse 3 the, the second seal. 
And another horse, verse 4, fiery red went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth. And that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. It's a red horse. It's associated here in scripture with bloodshed, with, with war. And although many of us were not alive to see it, We've all heard of the two atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan in World War II. Hiroshima and Nagasaki where 200,000 people died. 200,000. Today, one nuclear submarine carries enough war power equal to 40 times the two bombs dropped in World War II. And our world kind of has what they call the MAD theory, the MAD theory, mutually assured destruction, that because most of the major nations in the world have these nuclear powers and weapons, that we would not use them because we would destroy each other if we all used our nuclear power. But we're kind of in a new age now. It's different. Not only does some of the superpowers, so to speak, Russia, United States, China, have massive and many nuclear weapons, but so does North Korea, and Pakistan, and Iran, who are developing or have developed these nukes. And Iran has vowed, if you know this, you probably do, to wipe one day Israel off the map. And so this is the time and framework we're living in, the, the red horse, will bring great bloodshed and destruction upon the earth. And it's followed by a black horse. And there in verse 5, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and this horse thunders forth. And I looked, behold, a black horse, and he who sat on had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for denarius. Three quarts of barley for a denarius. Don't harm the oil and the wine. It's, it's the cost of food that has, you know, just gone out of sight. It's, it's scarcity. It's, it's famine and the result of the devastation of war that, that food costs soar and, and, and could be the precursor, really, to the economic issue where we're there needs to be control now over money, and perhaps this is when you begin to see the buying and the selling with the mark of the beast, because famine becomes so prevalent across the world, and food costs soar out of price. And many times war brings famine. And now there's another seal, verse 7, he opens the fourth seal. I heard the voice of a fourth living creature saying, once again, come forth, come and see. And I looked and behold, now it's a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with him. And power was given over fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death. And by the beasts of the earth, the pale Greek word is actually chloros, where we get our word chlorine. And it's sort of a yellow, greenish, kind of associated with sickness or death. This is the, 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 the death horse follows all that has gone before, all that has hit the ground so far. And this is, this is what some scientists believe is, is the aftermath of a nuclear war, which is, which is called a nuclear winter. I'm sure you've heard of it, where all the ash and the carbon and the smoke uh, fills the atmosphere and, and the smoke and the particles and the radiation. They say it would be over 150 million tons of smoke. You know, my, my, my daughter lives in uh, Fallon, Nevada, not far from Tahoe. 
and they recently had all these fires out in Tahoe. Maybe you saw it during the summer and the fires were burning out of control. Well, where, where they lived, all the ash and the smoke uh, covered from Tahoe all the way over to where she lives, which is almost an hour and 45 minutes away. And we were visiting out there and you come pulling into to, to Fallon, a place actually you never want to pull into. <laughs> and it's, it's just a desert. And so, but, but you, you could hardly see. It was smoky, it was, it was dark, and, and it affects the temperature. And, and many believe that, that because of this, this nuclear cloud and this, that, that it also increases the whole death and famine situation because uh, it, it'll slash the temperature of the earth by 90%. And, and it'll, it'll kill the crops. The growing season will, 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 will be a slash that way. And also, not only that, but it'll upset the technology and it'll be a big blackout all over the world as it has to do with internet and media and technology. And in 2020, we certainly saw something very small that, that although it, it wasn't small, it's small compared to this, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, which, you know, impacted the whole world. All of a sudden, I, I, I mean, at the beginning of it, no, no one really knew uh, what to think about it, right? I mean, we, were, we stopped church. We were like up here. Uh, we, we actually did Easter online. First time we've ever even considered doing that. I remember be, because I'm old, <laughs> my younger son who works here said, Dad, you should probably stay home. You know, you're, you're older now and don't, don't, you shouldn't be around people. I said, I don't consider you people, so I'm coming up, <laughs> up, up, up there anyway. But... None of us knew really how to respond, right? It was like, and we're wearing the mask, and we're, we're, we're like social distancing, and, and this, this whole phenomena that was going on, it's nothing compared to what will happen here. I mean, they say that COVID worldwide, you know, took out three million people. I, I don't know if that's totally true, because you and I both know that anybody who went in the hospital that was sick might have been said they had COVID. Uh, there's all kinds of rumors. I'm not gonna go down that rabbit trail this morning, but nothing compared to what's going to happen when these seals and this begins to occur on the face of the earth. And you've got that pale horse that's taking out such a, a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword. And then verse nine, he opens the fifth seal. And I saw, this kind of shifts up the altar, the souls of those who've been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. People who, who during this terrible time, I believe during this tribulation time, are willing to stand up for the truth of God's word and to share their testimony. Faith in, in the midst of opposition and so, so, so they're, they're asking in verse 10, how long these, these, these martyrs are crying out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And an answer is given. Then a white robe was given to each of them. And it was said to them, rest a little while longer into both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, were completed. God is giving more time. Rest, he says. And then it continues on. This is the time of great tribulation. I looked in verse 12 and he opened the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as fig trees drop its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. And the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. 
And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, they hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks and in the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us, not, not to kill us, but to hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And basically, who's able to stand? No one's able to stand in the midst of it. This is, this is something that's never occurred. And, and now this final seal is open and the planet is shaken. Listen, the planet is shaken to its core. Ever been in an earthquake? I've only been in one. It was a very minor one. I, I happened to be in Guatemala with my wife, and we were involved in the missions thing down there. And we're staying in this little guest house next to another house, and it was it was it was late at night, and and all of a sudden the the uh, closet door was rattling, and it swung open, and we woke up and Lynn goes, "What is that?" I go, "I don't know. I think it's an earthquake." And she goes, an earthquake? I, I goes, nothing I can do. <laughs> but it was. It was, a, it was a small tremor, but it shook the whole house and swung the closet door open. That's nothing compared to this. Disorder and chaos reign. The powers of nature and human government collapse. It's mayhem. People are literally calling upon nature, the rocks, the mountains to, to fall on us. God allows, we saw in the beginning of, of, of the chapter, we see the horsemen. God allows mankind to unleash his own wrath, his own weapons. But now God himself brings justice and judgment. As the stars begin to fall, there, there, in, there in verse 13, it, it tells us that, that and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Can you imagine watching the stars fall to the earth? You've seen a shooting star. In Amos chapter 5, verse 18, there's this ancient thing. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you it will be darkness and not light for those who don't know him. In Isaiah chapter 2, it says, They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth mightily. This is what happens in Revelation. It, it, it goes on. It talks about they shall go, they go into the clefts of the rocks and into the crags of the rugged rocks from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. And God one day will bring an end. He'll, he'll bring justice. And the response is, is interesting by, by mankind here. Here, here, here in chapter 6, it, it says they, they hide, hide us from the face of him. From the beginning of time, man has wanted to hide. All the way back to the garden when he first sinned, when he was first exposed by his deeds and who he was, in his heart and his, his desires of disobedience and, and following after the lusts of the flesh and the, you know, the pride of the eye, as we saw there, all the way back in the very beginning of time with Adam and Eve. And the first thing he does, he, he does what? He goes and he hides. And the Lord comes looking for him. Adam wanted to hide. And I think you and I, deep inside, you know, we at times, we, we love to hide. We love to hide our sin. The issues in our life that, that aren't right, we, we hide them from each other. I, I would, I would uh, bet that right now there, there's people in this room, you have things in your home or, or things in your life that are well hidden from the people that are closest to you. Because we hide. We, hi we hide those things that we, we know are wrong and, and we don't want people to know about them and, and they want to hide from God. God, God, don't look on me. Don't, don't see me for who I really am, which, which really is the best thing that could possibly happen to you, though, is to allow the Lord to see you as you really are. 
and come clean. When, when facing death or some major issue like divorce or, or fine financial loss, many times that's when people will turn to the Lord. But, but not always. I, may have sh I probably shared this story before uh, uh, about a guy I, I encountered who, who, who asked me to come visit him when he was dying. And, you know, we, we had a great discussion and, and, you know, we talked about his daughter and we talked about his son-in-law, how they were going to heaven. And I asked him the question, well, are you going to heaven? He goes, no, I'm not going to heaven. Why? Well, I don't believe. Like, what, what, what do you mean you don't? He said, I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe in Jonah. I don't believe in Noah. I don't believe in Moses and all that Red Sea stuff. That's all a fairy tale. I said, well, who told you I had to believe in Moses and Jonah and Noah? He said, well, I, I thought I had to believe the Bible to go to heaven. I said, you know, when I got saved, I didn't even know the Bible. I just believed in Jesus. I told him that's all you need to do is believe in Jesus and you can be saved. He goes, you mean I don't have to believe in Jonah and Noah and Moses? I go, no. And so he accepted the Lord. I did his funeral many months later. Now, I believe when he got to heaven, he saw Jonah, Moses, and Noah. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him he probably would. But that's not the first step, right? Amen. The first step is Jesus. And a lot of people get hung up on a lot of things. And, and many people uh, will, will come to the Lord. I've seen this over and over and over and over again. And, and the, the opportunities I've had as a pastor, when, when people get near death, God is so gracious that he gives them a second, third, fourth, or fifth chance. I mean, even on their deathbed, he comes knocking and calling. It's an amazing thing he does. I wouldn't encourage you to trust in that right now. But God's gracious. But a lot of times, listen, a lot of times, many people die as they lived. And here in Revelation chapter 6, people are dying with a hard heart. Hide us from him. Hide us from him. And you, you can spend a, a lifetime of hardening your heart and hiding from the Lord. But, but the one wonderful thing about this, this God of justice and mercy is that uh, he keeps knocking. He keeps seeking. He keeps calling. And it's amazing that he does that. As many times as we tell him no, he says, well, I'm still coming back. He's like the ultimate, someone that said, hound of heaven, you know, is constantly seeking after you. Maybe God's been knocking on your heart many, many times. Maybe he's been tugging on it and speaking to you. There's a lot happening very quickly and rapidly in our world. And I believe if God is doing anything through, through the circumstances and situations that are happening economically and medically and politically and all kinds of ways in our world, that God is trying to get our attention, your attention, my attention, and one of the things he's saying is, hey, hey, life is, is never going back. We talked about this in our men's breakfast yesterday. Life is not going back to the good old days. <laughs> Culture has radically changed, and, and we're not going to do a 180 and go back. Ozzie and Harriet, if you even know who they are. <laughs> and I think uh, the beaver and... Whatever his brother's name. What was his brother's name? Wally. Wally. Wally died recently. I don't know if you saw that. He's not coming back. So, so God is trying to get our attention. We're, we're on this sort of fast train, I think, to the end of time. 
It, it, I mean, it wouldn't be that surprising to see another, you know, worldwide, you know, issue or economy and, and things began to shut down. And, and it's certainly not outside the realm now because we live in such a globally connected environment that, that someone could say, hey, I, I can solve this problem. A one world leader. So the question comes, you know, out of this passage in, in Revelation chapter 6, as we look at this, this end time scenario, God, you know, finally saying, okay, it's time for me not only to allow you guys to, to be uninhibited in your warfare and your aggression toward one another, and, and, but, but now I, I myself are going to step in as the martyrs under the altar are saying, how long, how long? He says, oh, oh just a minute, we're almost there. So you ask the question of, of one another, do, do you know for sure how you'll die? Not the, not the method or the manner, but, but what your heart will be like when you, when you stand before him or when you're called home. You know, you know what's weird to me is uh, as, as I've aged over the years, my wife and I have been married a long time now. And we've got 13 grandkids, we've got grown kids. We're, we're, in this, we're in this stage of life where we look at each other and go, how did we get here? <laughs> what happened? We were the young people. And now our kids are looking at our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Have you experienced that? I think they're putting stickums on them like... And you're like, wow. I mean, we, we could go tomorrow and they'll just, they won't miss us that much. They'll, they'll just be fighting over, I thought I was getting the boat. No. Je Jesus speaks, I think, to all of us at some stage in our life. It certainly happened to me as a young man. I was 18, 19, totally lost, just out there. My, my background was not church. My, my parents had divorced when I was 13. There was all kinds of just confusion. And I, and I saw a bumper sticker in someone's car. It was actually taped on their, their glove box. It said, one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I thought, what does that mean? What does that mean? And Jesus began to speak, he began to tug, he began to knock. And, and you know that old verse, in, in, it's in Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. And I began to hear that voice, I began to hear that knock. And it, it wasn't overnight, but it just kept coming back and nothing else seemed to be working and you know nothing else seemed to be like making sense. And, 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 and I realize, and perhaps you have to, that God has done everything he needs to do. It's all been done that he might have a relationship with you and I. There's nothing else he's going to do. His son died on the cross. He said, it's finished. And now as, as, as the earth begins to, to reach a point like it is now, never been like this before, I would submit to you that... Uh, if you're not a Christian, you're not waiting on the Lord. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you. And he's calling you. And I would pray that you would not be like the people in Revelation chapter 6 that say, well, I just want to hide. And I just want to die in my sins. But that's not what he's designed you to do. He's not designed you to die in your sins. He's designed you to be free from them and cleansed by him. Because he's not only, as, as the theme of our, our, our time in Revelation, not only is he a God of justice, and justice will be administered, but he's constantly a God of mercy. Constantly a God of mercy. And if you're here today and you know him, you, you realize just how merciful he is. So he knocks and he calls. 
and he asks for us to respond, not to hide. 